Have you ever wondered why the study of the weather is called meteorology? In 467 BC, a bright comet appeared in the skies of the world, and in the Greek town of Egospotami, near the Dardanelles, a large brownish rock, about the size of a wagon load, fell as if from the sun and crashed to the ground. The rock was seized upon by awestruck locals, and 500 years later was still intact enough to be mentioned by the natural historian Pliny the Elder. By modern standards, Pliny was not an assiduous chronicler. He believed that hedgehogs caught apples by rolling on them and spearing them with their spines. His colorful accounts of beasts of far-off lands are largely responsible for the creation of the basilisk and the manticore, but at least he was astute enough to note that, quote, it will not be doubted that stones do frequently fall. The evidence was certainly on his side. Accounts of rocks falling from the sky were scattered all across the Greco-Roman world. These stones were often described as diospites, or Zeus fallen, and considered gifts from the gods. In the 3rd century AD, a Christian writer, inveighing against the gullibility of pagans, noticed that a local Anatolian shrine to Cybele had replaced her statue's face with a lump of presumably meteoric iron. A magical shield of iron, the Anseal, was said to have fallen from the sky during the time of the legendary, and likely fictional, second king of Rome, Pompilius. But despite all of these accounts, and even physical evidence left behind, one person who refused to countenance the idea of celestial rocks was, unfortunately, Aristotle. His conclusion about the rock of Aegospotami was that, since years with frequent comets are notoriously dry and windy, the rock had simply been picked up by the wind and then deposited elsewhere. That must have been some wind. For Aristotle, the idea that anything as common and perishable as a rock could fall from something as perfect and unblemished as the sky was not only distasteful, it was nonsensical. In Aristotle's eyes, the universe was cleft into two completely disconnected realms. The sublunar region, that of dirt, decay, change, corruption, and generation, and the world beyond the moon, incorruptible, unchanging, unalterable, and ungenerated. To Aristotle, the perfect, sweeping motions of the planets and stars, outside our mortal reach or mortal comprehension, were eternally separate from the perishable, temporary, chaotic world we inhabit. The heavens were composed of ether, a mystical substance that formed the giant, invisible spheres into which the planets, sun, moon, and fixed stars were set like gems. These spheres carried the planets in endless circular motions around our pitiful world. Said world comprised four elements. At the bottom, heavy earth, settled glumly at the center of the celestial sphere. Above it, water, seething and ebbing over the earth, building it up as it took it away. Above that, air, roaring across the water, churning it into waves. And above that, at the highest level, was the element of fire. It's important to note, though, that Aristotle did not see the region of fire as a ceaseless maelstrom of searing flame. Rather, it could best be described as a potential fire, pregnant energy waiting for an inflammable exhalation from the earth to rise above the region of air and ignite it. It was this potential fire Aristotle believed was the source of accounts for comets and shooting stars. They were merely bursts of flame as matter from below was consumed by the greedy fire above. Comets were merely larger, slower-burning exhalations, their tails dragged out by the motion of the celestial sphere. Quote, the fact that comets, when frequent foreshadow wind and drought, must be taken as an indication of their fiery constitution, he wrote, connecting his cosmology with another ancient assertion, that comets are harbingers of doom. As to the argument that comets move with the planets, well, they couldn't because they don't follow the zodiac. Name a planet that doesn't do that. Aristotle's book on weather phenomena, Meteorologica, which literally means the study of that which is lifted up, concerned not only wind and rain, but also the fiery events of the highest realm, comets, meteors, and even the Milky Way, all of which he believed 
were triggered by the motions of the wind, and earthquakes, which he believed were caused by earth settling as water evaporated from it. Thanks to the veneration which scholars in the West would hold Aristotle throughout the Middle Ages, the idea that comets and shooting stars were merely fiery explosions in the atmosphere would remain preeminent for 2,000 years. Even Ptolemy, the great 2nd century astronomer whose book The Almagest would be the standard text on the subject until the invention of the telescope, followed Aristotle's lead on comets, despite rejecting him on nearly everything else. That's not to say that Aristotle's ideas went completely unchallenged. In the first century, the Roman philosopher Seneca raised some shockingly valid objections to Aristotle's assertions. First, if comets' tails were caused by the motion of a celestial sphere, then they should all point in the same direction, but they don't. Second, if comets were suspended in our atmosphere, then they would move independently of the sun, moon, and stars. Instead, they rise and set just as they do. Finally, some comets have been visible in the sky for more than six months, a remarkable time for something to burn. In response to Aristotle's argument that comets didn't follow the zodiac, he said, quote, Who places one boundary for planets? Unquote. After all, even the planets' orbits were offset from each other. But Seneca failed to usurp Aristotle because he couldn't devise an alternative theory of comets that explained them just as well. There simply wasn't enough evidence. In the whole range of time past... Aristotle said, So far as our inherited records reach, no change appears to have taken place either in the whole scheme of the outermost heaven or in any of its proper parts. Unquote. In 1572, that would change. For 15 centuries, Comet's occasional disruption of the celestial order generated much the same reaction in humanity. They were seen as fiery omens, often of doom, victory, or both. A comet famously appeared after the murder of Julius Caesar, supposedly marking his ascension to godhood. If you believe Shakespeare, the days leading up to Caesar's death were also marked with portents from the sky. Quote, I have seen the ocean swell, rage in foam, as if it wanted to reach the storm clouds, says Casca in Julius Caesar. But never before tonight, never until now, have I experienced a storm that drops fire. Unquote. Cassius Dio had a comet augur the death of the consul Marcus Agrippa in 12 BC. The Jewish historian Josephus claimed that the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD was presaged by a comet that hung over the sky like the blade of a sword. In 451, a comet was believed to presage the defeat of Attila the Hun at the Battle of Chalon, while in 1066, a comet appeared before the Battle of Hastings and was seen as enough of a portent for the victors that it was woven into the Bayou Tapestry. In 1456, as the Ottoman Empire besieged Belgrade, a comet appeared above the field of battle, sparking predictions of a calamity. Pope Calixtus issued a bull requiring prayers for the population, and the siege ended with the Ottomans' defeat. But by 1531, the first stirrings of a new paradigm were beginning. That year, upon seeing a comet in the sky, the humanist philosopher Peter Appian noticed something that had been speculated about, but never confirmed. A comet's tail always points away from the sun. It was the first break away from the vision of Aristotle. A comet's tail was created by the sun, not by rotation of the heavenly spheres. And those spheres were about to be shattered. In 1560, a young boy named, and I'm only going to try to pronounce this once, Chir Braya, better known today as Tycho, observed a solar eclipse, and was simultaneously entranced by the ability of astronomers to predict it, and frustrated by the fact that the predicted date was off by an entire day. This set in his mind the roots of a burgeoning obsession, to bend the heavens to man's will, and ensure that they were always under his watchful eye. To this end, Tycho determined to create the most accurate catalogue of stars ever produced. Tycho's family were of the highest nobility. In their native Denmark, only royalty commanded them, and they were groomed from birth to serve their royal masters either as soldiers or as diplomats. Of course, young Tycho was expected to follow in the family trade, and at first he did, pursuing astronomy at night during his years at university while studying law during the day, apparently deeming sleep an affectation for lesser men. While no one could doubt his energy and dedication, this also spoke to Tycho's principal flaw, an ego of almost literally 
cosmic proportions, enlivened by a gargantuan personality. In 1566, at the age of 19, Tycho employed his skills as an astrologer to proclaim a recent lunar eclipse, a sign of the death of the Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. Tycho even wrote a poem proclaiming his joy at the event. Only problem? Suleiman was already dead, and had been for weeks. This led to much tittering among his fellow students, one of whom, Tycho, infuriated, challenged to a duel. This was a mistake. Tycho finished the duel with his nose all but severed from his face, a blemish he remedied with a prosthesis made of gold and silver and secured with glue, which he would wear for the rest of his life. And then, in November 1572, at the age of 25, Tycho changed the world. That month, a star suddenly erupted from the dark, appearing as if from nothing, and gaining in brightness until it rivaled even Venus. For over a year, this disruptive, inexplicable apparition remained visible to the naked eye, before fading once again into nothing. The star was seen across the world, of course. Queen Elizabeth summoned her astrologers to counsel her about this strange omen, while the Emperor of China was advised to reconsider his behavior in light of this warning. But only Tycho saw it for what it was. This was no ignited exhalation. To prove it, Tycho employed a technique called diurnal parallax. Parallax is the only direct way to gauge heavenly distances. When an object is observed first from one position, and then another, it appears to shift against the background. You can see this yourself if you hold a pencil in front of your face, cover one eye, and then the other. The planets and stars were too far away for parallax measurements to work, although that didn't stop Tycho from trying. But the moon happens to be close enough for its parallax to be observed from different points on Earth. And since the Earth rotates, or as Tycho would have said, since the celestial sphere rotates, it is possible to gain a parallax measurement of the moon's distance as the Earth carries you from one point to another. Tycho had determined that the moon's parallax was one full degree of arc. If, as had always been assumed, the new star was merely a fireball in our atmosphere, then it would lie below the moon and its parallax would be larger. Instead, the star showed no parallax whatsoever. There was no doubt. The star lay beyond the moon. It is difficult for us moderns to understand just how epochal this discovery was. For 2,000 years, the doctrine of Aristotle had reigned supreme. Earth was below, the heavens above, and never the twain shall meet. The heavens were perfect, incorruptible, and unchangeable. Astronomy wasn't physics, it was mathematics. What was the point of debating cause and effect in the heavens when no causes or effects could be seen? Astronomers could plot, log, and predict, but never understand. To paraphrase Tennyson, theirs was not to reason why, theirs was but to strain the eye. But here, in this new star, was a direct refutation of that doctrine, a blatant imperfection, an intrusion and change indisputably within the realm in which Aristotle had claimed none could be. But Tycho paid him no heed. Quote, Let all philosophers, new as well as ancient, be silent. Let the very theologians, interpreters of the divine mysteries, be silent. Let the mathematicians, describers of the heavenly bodies, be silent. For Tycho, the best teacher of theology, was the universe itself. Tycho wrote up his discovery in his book Concerning the New Star Never Before Seen in the Life or Memory of Anyone, usually shortened in Latin to Concerning the New Star or De Nova Stella. Contrary to Tycho's typically brash claim, his was not the first Nova Stella to be observed. Another Nova had been seen by Chinese and Arab astronomers in 1054, now believed to be the source of the Crab Nebula. And an even brighter Nova was seen in 1006 even by Europeans, but his was the first to be recognized, and thus the first to be given that name. Tycho's Nova made him an astronomical sensation. Despite having described his fellow astronomers in his preface to De Nova Stella as, quote, thick wits and blind watchers of the sky, said thick wits were determined to praise him to those same skies. In 1574, after performing some ambassadorial duties for the Danish king, Frederick II, he was offered a choice of manner, and, once he explained that he wished to focus on his astronomy rather than military or administrative duties, 
was granted the island of Vien, then an undeveloped patch of land farmed by fifty families who considered themselves freeholders under the crown. They weren't any more. With Tico now in full command, their lives would change substantially for the worse. Now, not only were they expected to pay part of their crop in tax, but they were expected to donate a number of their workdays a month toward the construction of his dream, Uraniborg, the castle of Urania, muse of astronomy. For reasons which will soon be apparent, Uraniborg no longer exists, but a glimpse of just how stunning Tycho's vision was can still be seen in illustrations. Its grandeur is estimated to have cost Tycho's patron, King Frederick, 1% of Denmark's entire annual budget. Tycho conceived Uraniborg not as a castle, but as a temple, both to the goddesses of the night sky and to himself. Tycho outfitted Uraniborg with a suite of the most precise astronomical instruments ever designed, all designed by him. The telescope was yet to be invented, and astronomy largely still relied on the tools of Ptolemy and his successors, but Tycho pushed their capabilities to their absolute limit. He employed a full-time staff of six skilled laborers on site who worked for up to three years to complete his tools to his exacting specifications, and also his own paper mill and printing press to ensure that he would be the first to publicize his discoveries. One entire wall of Uraniborg was taken up by a gigantic mural quadrant, or a wall-mounted device for measuring celestial angles three times as tall as a human. His great equatorial armillary, ten feet wide, could measure angular distances the width of a human hair at arm's length, ten times the accuracy of any before it. A great brass celestial globe, five feet across, served as a record for his precise stellar measurements, with each new star added as its position was locked. To protect these sensitive instruments from the effects of temperature and wind, Tycho housed them in a largely subterranean observatory he called Stjernaborg, Star Castle, which he bedecked with golden lions, portraits of the great astronomers of history, and grand Latin inscriptions praising himself and his achievements. At the end of the wall of the portraits there was, of course, Tycho, and then the future. Tychonides, his descendant, the only man who could ever surpass him. It was this ego, perhaps more than anything, that would ultimately be his undoing. He had a habit of speaking to royals as equals and of ignoring or half-heartedly complying with their commands, believing that his work would be service enough. His callous treatment of his tenants was not, arguably, beyond how he was permitted or even expected to act as a feudal lord but his outrageous personality likely contributed to the hatred which they would harbor toward him even after his death. That, and the fact that Uraniborg was built over their common pasture land. It didn't help that Tycho deliberately cultivated the image of a dark sorcerer, conducting alchemical experiments during the day and casting anyone who challenged him in the courts into his dungeon. While entertaining guests, he would surreptitiously tug a bell pool which set off an alarm at the other end of the house, beyond the hearing of anyone present, and then, right before he knew his servant was about to enter the room, whisper his name, as if he were conjuring him from the nether. I don't want to oversell Tycho as a fairy tale villain. For all his faults, he had a number of exceptional qualities. He was intensely meritocratic, and hired his army of assistants based solely on ability. Most of his clerks and artificers came from lower class or, in the case of his most celebrated collaborator, Johannes Kepler, impoverished backgrounds. He seemed to despise his aristocratic status, and in fact married a commoner, a technically illegal act that required him to rely on ancient Viking polygamy rules still on the statute books. His grand sextant was gilded with the fineries of nobility, yet also with reminders of its fleeting nature, a skeleton, a withered tree, and inscribed with the line by the spirit we live, the rest belongs to death. Perhaps it's fitting that he saw impermanence where others saw eternity. And, in 1577, he would see it again. That year, a great comet arrived and stunned the world with its beauty and duration. Tycho was a Lutheran, and Martin Luther had decreed that comets were ordained by God to instill terror and a sign of the last days. Tycho, true to form, said bollocks to that. Not only was he able to prove through diurnal parallax once again that the comet was beyond the moon, but he also showed that it was moving in what appeared to be a straight line through the paths of the planets. Over the years, 
Aristotle's concept of the unchangeable celestial spheres carrying the planets around had calcified into solid interlocking crystalline structures, perhaps due to conflation with the biblical firmament, the adamantine dome that held up the sky in Genesis. And yet, here was this comet, smashing its way through the spheres as if they were nothing. For Kepler, an ardent Copernican, this was evidence enough to kill them for good. But Tycho, while he idolized Copernicus, wasn't about to embrace heliocentrism without parallax, which should have been observable in the stars if the Earth were truly moving around the sun. In fact, it is, but it is so minute that it would be 300 years before anyone saw it. Instead, he devised a compromise model, now called the Tychonic system, in which Earth remains at the center of the universe, with the sun and moon in orbit around it, while the five planets orbit the sun. This vision of the universe actually accounted for all the observed motions of the heavens, as well as Ptolemy's or Copernicus's, and would also eventually be used to counter the evidence of Galileo, whose telescopic observations were able to show that Venus, but not Earth, orbited the sun. By the end of the 16th century, and nearing his own death, Tycho had catalogued the positions of nearly 1,000 stars, a fifth of those visible to the naked eye from the northern hemisphere, to an accuracy never before achieved. The great work of his life was almost complete, but he would not see it done, partly due to his mortality, but mostly due to his failings. After King Frederick's death, the throne of Denmark passed to his young son Christian. Christian had little time for old fogies like Tycho, and was showing interest in the fad for absolute monarchy currently sweeping Europe after the fall of the medieval social order. As part of his endowment from Frederick, Tycho had been given the canonry of Roskilde Cathedral, the chapel in which Frederick's father, and eventually Frederick himself, were buried. Tycho had, unsurprisingly, made a number of enemies at court, and, sensing a chance to finally rid themselves of their hated witch lord, his tenants complained to them that he wasn't attending to the chapel's upkeep. This was very likely true. The canonry was usually seen as purely a cash cow for its holder. But Tycho, ever distracted by the cosmos, made things far worse than they otherwise could have been. His lackadaisical attempts to shore up the chapel only came across as insulting, and eventually, tired of his insubordination, Christian not only revoked Tycho's heir's rights to Uraniborg, but reduced his pension to the point where the castle's upkeep became impossible, and he was forced to move to Copenhagen. His tenants, seeing their time, razed Uraniborg to the ground, erasing any and all trace of their hated master, whose name would be a curse among the people of Wien until well into the 19th century. I only have one unsighted line in Wikipedia to back this up, but apparently one of Tycho's court enemies orchestrated a mob riot outside of Tycho's house in Copenhagen. If that had only happened outside Uraniborg, it would have completely cemented Tycho forever as the ultimate Dark Lord. Eventually, even Denmark would prove too hostile for Tycho, and he was forced to seek the patronage of the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, under which he came to settle in Prague. Before he left, Tycho composed an elegy to his home country, lamenting its foolishness at letting him go. Only a few of the Danes honored my work. Herculean it was, for as they say that Hercules held up the fainting Atlas and hindered heaven's fall from pole to pole, you, Ptolemy, Alfonso, Copernicus, I gave a hand. You slipped, but I stood fast. The motion of stars you could not grasp as I have done. Tycho died in 1601, but if you thought he would go quietly into that good night, you haven't been paying attention. According to Kepler's account, during a banquet, Tycho refused to rise from the table to relieve his bladder, fearing a breach of etiquette. When he returned home, he found he could not urinate and was in excruciating pain. Soon, he passed into delirium, during which he called out repeatedly that his name should not be remembered in vain. How apropos that those should be his last words. Tycho being Tycho, his death would attract all forms of legendary. For decades, it has been speculated that he was murdered, perhaps on the orders of Christian, who suspected of having slept with his sister, or perhaps by Johannes Kepler, who sought access to his data. In 2010, Tycho's body was exhumed to settle the matter, and the investigation found that no poisons of any lethal dosage were detectable, ruling out murder, though they did suggest he suffered from mild mercury poisoning, proving once again that alchemy is bad for you. Kepler would eventually finish the Rudolphine tables, as they were called, 
and thanks to Tycho's phenomenally precise measurements, would ultimately construct his elliptical model of planetary motion, which would one day pave the way for Isaac Newton and the acceptance of the heliocentric theory. In a sense, Kepler was Tycho's prophesied descendant, though a descendant of knowledge rather than blood. But beyond this point, neither Tycho nor Kepler, nor even Galileo, would further our understanding of comets. Tycho refused to believe that such inferior objects could orbit with the perfect planets and assume they must travel the universe in straight lines. Galileo's concept of comets was more aggressive even than Tycho's, falling back on the discredited Aristotelian concept of exhalations. It would be over a century before the man who would ultimately bring the universe down to Earth arrived. An unassuming, studious man named Edmund Halley. Okay, before we go any further, let's lead the elephant out of the room. No one knows precisely how Edmund Halley's surname is pronounced. Variant spellings during his lifetime have it as Halley, Haley, and even Holly. But I'm going with Halley for this recording since it is the most popular pronunciation among those who bear that name today. But please don't take it as a prescription. Edmund Halley was born in 1656 in Haggerston, then a leafy suburb east of London. His father was a beefeater at the Tower of London. Really. It was his father's position at the Tower that likely led to Halley's first employment, for after his father, his first patron was Jonas Moore, the Surveyor General of the Ordnance, a position headquartered at the Tower. Through Moore, Halley would meet John Flamsteed, soon to be the first Astronomer Royal, with whom he would determine the rotation period of the Sun while the Royal Greenwich Observatory was under construction. Unlike the grandiose Tycho, the sources I've studied have little to say of Halley as a person, only that he was apparently well-liked and good company, which is fair. One thing that can be said about him, with iron certainty, is that he was smart. Scarily smart. Indeed, he appears to have been one of those people for whom the concept of childhood was a vague philosophical abstraction. In 1673, at the age of 17, he matriculated at Queen's College, Oxford, where, while still an undergraduate, he published several accepted scientific papers on the motions of the bodies of the solar system. At the age of 20, he left college and secured backing to travel alone to St. Helena, a forsaken rock square in the middle of the South Atlantic, to make the first ever telescope catalogue of the southern stars. By this point, the invention of the telescope had rendered Tycho and Kepler's catalogue obsolete, but telescopic surveys were still confined to the northern hemisphere, one of which Flamsteed was then undertaking at Greenwich. Unfortunately. Halley had failed to grasp the fact which would doubtless play a role in the British government's decision a century later to send Napoleon there to die. St. Helena is a miserable, rain-swept hellhole. After 18 months of dogged dreariness and countless washed-out nights, Halley managed to plot the positions of 341 stars. This was enough of an achievement for Flamsteed to declare Halley upon his return the Southern Tycho. In recognition of his work, King Charles II declared Halley a graduate of Oxford, on the ancient grounds of Because I Say So. In 1678, at the age of 22, Halley was inducted into the Royal Society, and in 1681, he began down the road that would lead to his immortality. That year, a great comet appeared in the sky. It was the first comet to be discovered by telescope, and is sometimes called Kirsch's Comet, in honor of the man who did so. At one point, the comet seemed to disappear, and then, a few months later, another comet appeared, far dimmer and moving in the opposite direction. In his correspondence with Halley, John Flamsteed suggested the two comets were in fact the same comet, diving first toward the sun, only to be batted back like a squash ball. Having no concept of gravity, Flamsteed employed the language of magnetism and vortices, an idea taken from René Descartes. Flamsteed believed that the comet had been repelled by the sun's light magnetic charge. Halley, conversely, attempted to model the comet's motion employing Tycho's idea of comets moving in straight lines, but found that the math didn't fit, and that the comet's motion was initially swifter than afterward, which, incidentally, was true. In February 1681, Flamsteed sent a letter outlining his idea to an eccentric Cambridge professor named Isaac Newton. Newton's response congratulated Flamsteed for his caution in not publishing such an obviously false hypothesis before he, Newton, could review it. If that smells somewhat of Tycho to you, then you have a pretty firm grasp of Newton's personality. Newton showed that, rather than being batted back like a ball, the comet, to match observations, would have had to have swung around the back of the sun, 
before re-emerging on the other side. Newton rejected the idea of magnetism, since the sun was far too hot to be magnetized, and even entertained the possibility of the comet being two different comets, due to the changes in angular velocity and the remarkable shift in brightness. But eventually, once the comet's positions were accurately collated, it was found that Newton's parabola slingshot was the best fit. And for that reason, the comet of 1680 is sometimes also called Newton's Comet, even if that grants him perhaps a little too much credit. Flamsteed never let Newton forget that he determined the comet's trajectory first. In 1682, while on a tour of Rome, Halley observed another comet alongside Giovanni Cassini. Speculation was running rampant. Was this the same comet that had appeared in 1680? If so, by what path had it returned? Christina Alexandra, the exceptionally learned former Queen of Sweden, offered a prize to anyone who could calculate the comet's motion, which, sadly, no one took her up on. It's interesting to note that this same Christina had decided to abdicate her throne 25 years earlier, supposedly after interpreting a comet as an omen of disaster, an indication of how far and how fast human perceptions of the universe were shifting. Unfortunately, things would soon turn sour for young Mr. Halley. For reasons still not fully understood, his friendship with Flamsteed rapidly degenerated into bitter animosity, and the newly married Halley found himself on the wrong side of the Astronomer Royal at just the moment when he needed him most. And in 1684, burdened by debts from the Great Fire of London eight years earlier and an unhappy second marriage, Halley's father committed suicide or perhaps was murdered as part of a convoluted plot involving the death of the Earl of Essex and an attempted assassination of Charles II, but let's not get off track here. And Halley, devoid of new income and saddled with the duty of the deposition of his father's estate, which caused his widowed stepmother to sue him at one point, agreed to take a clerk's job at the Royal Society, which he would hold for several years. That same year, Halley was chatting in a coffee house, as you do, with his friends Robert Hooke and Christopher Wren, who together, though mostly Wren, had rebuilt London after the Great Fire. Robert Hooke was also a scientist of some note. He was the first to propose the wave theory of light, and among the first to suggest that fossils were once living organisms. His work with the microscope led him to coin the word cell and to produce micrographia, one of the great masterpieces of scientific art. A question had been circulating around the learned sphere for some time regarding what would in time be called Kepler's laws. The planets move in ellipses, their motions cover equal areas in equal times, and the farther a planet is from the sun, the more slowly it moves. But why? And how? The question Halley proposed to his friends that day was, what shape would a planet's orbit take, assuming an inverse square law for the sun's attraction? An inverse square law means that the effect reduces by the square of the distance, which is what you would expect from, say, an ever-expanding sphere of effect emanating from a single point of origin. Hooke claimed that he had already calculated it, but Wren didn't believe him and offered a prize of 40 shillings to anyone who could conclusively do so within two months. The prize was never claimed. But some time later, likely while on business in Cambridge, Halley thought he might pay a visit to Newton and ask him. When Halley proffered the question to Newton, Newton responded promptly. An ellipse. Halley, dumbfounded, asked how he knew this. I have calculated it, Newton said. But in typical Newtonian fashion, said that he'd forgotten where he'd put the equations. Within weeks, Halley and Newton had produced a short paper called On the Motion of Bodies in Orbit, which showed that the motions identified by Kepler were a natural consequence of an inverse square law of attraction. Halley suggested that the Royal Society might provide funding for the publication of a larger, more comprehensive work. Unfortunately, the Royal Society had just lost a great deal of money publishing a massive flop called The History of Fish, and were in no position to cover the cost. If the already cash-strapped Halley wished the most epochal publication in the history of human inquiry to see the light of day, he'd have to publish it himself. So he did. Isaac Newton's Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, usually shortened to The Principia, is, simply put, one of the most important books ever written. It is possible to break the history of science, and indeed the history of humanity, into pre- and post-Principia. Prior to the Principia, it was still arguable that the realms of heaven were subject to their own unquestioned and unquestionable laws, beyond the understanding of petty mortals. After the Principia, humanity lived in a world in which the motions of planets and pea shooters, satellites and slingshots, could be explained using the same relatively simple laws. 
after the Principia, not even the most ardent opponent of heliocentrism would bother defending his position to the wise. Newton's universe required it. Newton's laws allowed us to know the relative distances between the planets, simply by measuring their speed. They allowed us to weigh the Earth, Sun, and Moon, explain how the Earth kept its atmosphere even as it moved, and open the way to a vast new universe of a billion suns. They have so utterly rewritten our collective psyche that today our minds work in Newtonian metaphors. Friction, momentum, acceleration, inertia, orbit, and even miles per hour. Buried within this world-changing work, of course, was an accurate method for determining the paths of comets, largely based on the comet of 1680, which was thus the first comet to have its motion calculated. The Principia also showed that comets' tails are only visible after crossing the orbit of Jupiter, and that their tails grow larger as they approach the Sun. For this and other reasons, he concluded that a comet's tail could not simply be refracted sunlight, and most likely consisted of a cloud emerging from the comet's head created by the heat of the Sun. Newton also commented that the free movements of the comets throughout the sky showed, as the executed heretic theologian Giovanna Bruno had suspected 200 years before, that, quote, the heavens are lacking in resistance. As well as pay for its publication, Halley acted as editor, printer, and promoter of the Principia, which meant not only composing a Latin ode for the epigraph, but also regular correspondence with Newton. As a man, Newton has gone down in history as difficult would be the best word, I think. When Robert Hooke, who had a tendency to come up with ideas and then not bother to publish them, roasted Halley for stealing the inverse square law of gravity from him, Newton had a fit and almost refused to publish the Principia's third volume which would have been problematic because it was the volume that explored the observational implications of Newton's laws, including the tides, the centrality of the sun, and, of course, comets. The debate was more than just academic. Hooke had savaged Newton's first attempt at scientific publishing, a now legendary paper on optics, so brutally that Newton refused to publish his response until after Hooke was dead. Halley, aware of Newton's quirks, flooded him with feverishly fawning letters to assuage his wounded ego, ensuring that he finished the book. Newton, however, neither forgot nor forgave. Indeed, that Newton eventually became the most powerful and influential scientist in the world is the reason you've never heard of Robert Hooke. Halley remained out of pocket for the entire endeavor, and on top of that, the Royal Society had yet to pay him his salary. When, alongside a 20-pound bonus in recognition of his efforts, they decided to reimburse him what they owed, the R.S. did so in the form of 70 unsold copies of the History of Fish. The first edition of the Principia sold between 250 and 400 copies at a cost of 7 shillings unbound and 9 shillings bound. I have been unable to determine if Halley profited substantially from the publication, though I certainly hope so. Tycho had solved the first great mystery of comets. They were celestial objects not atmospheric disturbances. Newton had solved the second, how they traveled through the solar system. But questions remain. What were they? Of what were they composed? And perhaps most intriguingly, were they periodic? Or did they simply visit our solar system on whirlwind tours through interstellar space? In 1695, Halley reteamed with Newton to polish up the cometary data for the second edition of the Principia. And this time, it was Halley who took the lead. While searching for patterns in comet observations, Halley constructed a table that could pinpoint the position of any parabolic comet at any point after perihelion. Newton was happy to play second fiddle and based most of his conclusions in the second edition on Halley's calculations. As Halley waded through the decades of data, though, something began to strum in his brain. The great comet of 1682, the one he'd observed with Giovanni Cassini, appeared to be a variation on a theme. Seventy-five years before it, in 1607, another comet had been observed and recorded by Johannes Kepler, and seventy-six before that, in 1531, there was the comet recorded by Peter Appian. The numbers plotting their motions were nearly identical. Could they be the same? How they considered that the changes in return dates might have been due to the gravity of Jupiter and Saturn. In 1705, in his Synopsis of the Astronomy of Comets, Halley pushed the apparitions even further back in time, connecting the previous three to the Hungarian battle omen of 1456. And then, quote, I dare venture to foretell that it will return again in the year 1758. And if it should then return, we shall have no reason to doubt that the rest must return too. Therefore, 
Astronomers will have a large field to exercise themselves in for many ages before they will be able to know the number of those many and great bodies revolving around the common center of the sun. Eddie baby, you don't even know. Testing Halley's cometary prediction was not simply a matter of spending all of 1758 standing on a hill and glancing at a watch. The calculations required to pinpoint the comet's exact date of arrival were so complex they required new forms of mathematics to perform. Many great mathematicians of the time took one look at what was required and gave up then and there. The work of Alexis Claude Clairaut, Jérôme Lelande, and Nicole Reine Le Pau were at the time considered the greatest feat of applied mathematics ever attempted, and they were still a month off. In fact, the comet wasn't seen until Christmas Day, 1758, and only reached its closest point to Earth in March of 1759. The comet's return was seen not only as a triumph for Halley, but for Newton as well. It was as clear a demonstration of the explanatory power of his laws as could be hoped for, and the first confirmation that anything other than planets orbited the sun. As Lalande said, quote, The universe beholds this year the most satisfactory phenomenon ever presented to us by astronomy, an event which, unique until this day, changes our doubts to certainty and our hypotheses to demonstration. Unquote. Nonetheless, there was no opposition when that year the French astronomer Nicolas Louis de la Calle named the comet Halley. Halley's appearances have now been tracked thousands of years back in the historical record. In fact, apart from the comet supposedly heralding the divinity of Caesar, every comet whose omens I mentioned at the start of this video is now either known or suspected to have been Halley. Today, we know of several comets, such as Comet Enka and Comet Holmes, that make short runs around the sun and revisit the Earth every few years. But they require a telescope to be seen. Halley remains the only short-period comet visible to the naked eye, and its infrequent returns are greeted with the joy of a family reunion. Edmund Halley would not live to see his prediction fulfilled, having died in 1742. However, he did get to taste the sweet revenge of long life when, in 1720, he succeeded the now very dead John Flamsteed as the second astronomer royal. Halley's achievements went far beyond his comets. His calculations paved the way for the first true determination of distances within the solar system. He created the first ever meteorological map, employing notation still used today, and, by examining ancient Arabic records, he was able to show that the moon was gradually receding from the Earth. But perhaps his most profound discovery, more so even than the comet that bears his name, came when he turned his attention to the stellar tables of the ancient Greeks, such as Hipparchus, and Timacharis. After accounting for 2,000 years of axial precession, and for the less than perfect measurements of earlier times, Halley found that the positions of three stars, Aldebaran, Sirius, and Arcturus, could not be explained by either means, and concluded that the stars themselves must have moved in the intervening millennia. Halley's discovery of the proper motion of stars broke the universe wide open. For two millennia, the sphere of the fixed stars had been the outermost limit of human understanding. But now, that was gone. The fixed stars were not fixed. Like everything else, they were subject to change. Like Tycho before him, Halley had shown conclusively that there are no places in the universe subject to any laws beyond our understanding. As above, so below. Or perhaps, as below, so above. Halley had gone some way toward cracking the mystery of comets, but the question of what they were made of remained. Halley finally learned that I will be discussing in the next episode.